Welcome back. And uh, tonight we turn to our topic following on our discussion of the church last week, which today is monasticism, prayer, and the sacraments. And that might seem like a bit of a mouthful. It might equally cause some bewilderment. Why on earth have we linked these three things together? And in order to um, address uh, that, I'm going to open up the presentation immediately and we will launch into a discussion starting with that last question. Why these three um, topics, monasticism, prayer and the sacraments should be linked. So here's our opening screen giving us uh, the title. And the very next slide asks the question that I've just posed, assuming that it's a question that um, you all might be asking. But why link these three things? And I think the answer to that question is of utmost importance as we learn about orthodoxy. The reason being I have no formal session simply called the Orthodox Life. When we were talking less formally before this uh, presentation began, I used the word phronema, the idea of an Orthodox mindset. And there are many um, lifelong Orthodox or those who have been Orthodox for a much longer time than even I have that express concern sometimes that converts have not yet developed the orthodox phrenema. And this can be irksome. It can be irksome because it suggests sometimes that everybody develops at exactly the same pace and that at some point in the future, we'll be able to declare that we have the orthodox mindset or the orthodox phrenema. I don't think that's true. I think we all develop at different times and what's important is that we continue or that we begin to and continue to across the whole course of our lives develop in our understanding of, in our appropriation of the fullness of the Orthodox faith. So why link these three things? Because together they are the Orthodox life, monasticism, prayer, and the sacraments. So let's say that you have spent some time online exploring orthodoxy this doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing although it certainly can be it can be because there is a great deal of material out there that uh, is inclined towards polemicism in other words it can be inclined towards the uh, criticism, sometimes extreme criticism of other Christian practices. Um, it can be uh, divisive even within orthodoxy because it can posit one particular view as the absolute truth um, while ignoring uh, other sort of entirely legitimate orthodox practices. Um, it can encourage people to think of orthodoxy more as an identity as opposed to a life. All of these are dangers presented by um, what we might call online orthodoxy or internet orthodoxy. The thing is, what really matters is that when we pull away from our screens, we understand orthodoxy to be a life a life not made up of time spent online, but rather a life made up of different facets with which, for example, an Orthodox monastic would closely identify. So I'm making the link between the Orthodox life we are invited to live and the way a monastic a monk or a nun takes on the Orthodox life for themselves in a publicly declared sort of way. In order to explain this, I want to look first at the words of Metropolitan Herothius of Napactos, 
who wrote, monasticism is the glory of the church, and the monks, as St. Gregory of Nyssa taught, are the crown of the body of the church. The monastic life is the Christian life, the way of the prophets, apostles, and martyrs. In reality, it is the evangelical life, as a life of repentance and keeping Christ's commandments to as perfect a degree as possible. Now, that's an incredibly striking passage. And there are maybe those who would like to take issue with it, in which case I understand. But really, I think at the heart of it is this line. And it's this line that Metropolitan Hierotheus is not alone in uttering. I first encountered it when I was reading Paul F. Dokomov's uh, book simply called Orthodoxy. And if you want to go further in your explanation, or sorry, in your exploration of the faith, um, please take a look at the book. It is dense. It is academic. I think it was F. Dokomov's uh, doctoral thesis um, defended at uh, Institut Saint-Serge in Paris um, and then translated into English. But whether I'm right about that specifically or not, the fact is it can be a heavy book, however. I personally found it incredibly helpful and is a go-to when I've got questions and, and thinking uh, more deeply about the different dimensions of what makes up the Orthodox life. But in that book, he says almost these exact words. The monastic life is the Christian life. Now, does that mean that each and every one of us is called to be a monk or a nun? No, of course not. I'm sitting here talking to you as a married priest. And as I mentioned in, I think it was our previous uh, session together, probably half the priests of the Orthodox Church are married priests. But interestingly, I used to make a bit of a joke. I had uh, a friend who was a monk, and I would say to him that, um, if my wife ever woke up and found me gone, she wouldn't have to worry about me having run off with another woman. No, she would only have to go to the monastery and find that I was hiding out there. It's not because I have any intention of doing that to her or my family, but because I've always had a love for the monastic life. And what my friend, the monk, would say to me in response was, and I'll use my secular name here, was, James, you've got a monastic life. It's called your family. It's called your home life. It's called the responsibilities you already live day to day in the context of prayer. Now, I left a moment of silence after that because that is where the rubber hits the road when it comes to the Orthodox Christian life, and I think gives definition or resonance to these words, the monastic life is the Christian life. But what we'll do now in order to sort of understand this more fully, um, go into it more deeply, is to explore monasticism itself. And I count on uh, Brother Basil in particular uh, to enlighten us further uh, if there are things that he thinks uh, we need to um, explore or understand better uh, at the end of this uh, um, slideshow. But let's take a stab at it in the meantime. So the monastic life is the Christian life, means walking according to God's way by living a prayerful life with repentance and seeking to be as close as possible to Christ, especially as he is present in the sacraments. Now, if you read again to yourself what's on the screen, you'll see how, if that's a definition of monasticism in a nutshell, how much does it not also apply to each and every one of us? And of course, the answer to that is entirely. Walking according to God's way 
check by living a prayerful life with repentance check and seeking to be as close as possible to christ especially as he is present in the sacraments check that applies to all of us but if it applies to us then why are there monks and nuns why is there a separate or an identified monastic life well if we look at what constitutes a monastic life particularly as it applies to monks living within um, a monastery as we would conceive it conventionally uh, then we can um, see that a monk's prayer and contemplation is what he undertakes on an ongoing basis this is um you know what the quiet time in the monastery is dedicated to but equally the monastery um does as saint paul himself commands and that is it works for its bread and so in the middle here we have a picture of a monk working i'm assuming he's making uh prayer ropes there but it doesn't have to be specifically uh, religious work like that it could well be um farming it could be um writing manuscripts it could be um undertaking anything from work in the kitchen to um to taking care of guests the fact is it's work that parallels the kind of work any of us might be doing in the world so prayer and contemplation that's what motivates the monk that's like the blood that runs through the veins the work is what's being done with the hands all the time and at the heart of monastic activity at the heart of the life of the monk is the divine services and so you've got those three represented in these images before you um but they all work together sort of like this before i um reveal what we're going to see in this picture in a moment i want you to take note of the fact that at the top i've called it sanctifying time now i want to say a few words about that in about i think it was 2008 there was a film released in cinemas it had popular release it was called um uh, in french la grande silence in english i think it was translated into great silence but it was the uh it was a film uh, documenting the life of la grande chartreuse which is one of the great um, carthusian monasteries in france in the alps now um of course here i'm talking about a latin monastery but the idea still pertains and the idea is this that film uh which was directed by a german filmmaker was one that was more than 10 years in the works the reason being i can't remember the name of the german filmmaker but he wrote to the abbot of la grande chartreuse and asked if he could come and stay with the monks and film their lives and when he first wrote his letter he got a letter back from the abbot that read simply we are not yet ready and so ended his hopes and dreams he simply shelved the idea then 10 years later he got another letter from the abbot simply stating we're ready and so the filmmaker went and sat down with the abbot and negotiated that he would be allowed to film over the course of a year but that he was not allowed to use any additional lighting equipment or any additional sound equipment that the film had to be made only using his um, camera and nothing else um, lest it become intrusive on the monks lives so that's what he did and the final product which was three hours long and almost entirely silent you'd think was a sleeper 
Um, but I saw it in cinemas and I was utterly riveted, not just because I was already positively disposed to a film with a bunch of church scenes, because there was an exquisite beauty to observing the lives of these monks as they unfolded in time. Day after day, following the same pattern, but day after day leading into month after month, into season after season. And what the filmmaker does so beautifully is he integrates shots of the skies above the, uh, the monastery in the Alps, crisp, clear skies wherein you're able to see the passing constellations and equally on the ground, see the seasons change. And so what you come away with is this fundamental understanding that the work of the monks is that of sanctifying time. So we, in the course of our Orthodox lives, take up bread and wine and we offer them up so that they are taken onto the holy table and sanctified, set aside, declared to be the body and blood of Christ. And we do that with matter in our three-dimensional lives, but we can sometimes lose sight of time. After all, we get up in the morning, we go to work, we come home, we have our dinner, we run our kids around or do whatever, and then we go to bed and start all over again. And it's so easy, so easy to lose sight of ourselves as time flows by. Not so for the monastic life. As they go about the same things we go about, they do so with a special connection to time as it um, as it proceeds. And that has theological and spiritual significance of, of immense richness and something for which we give thanks because we're all members of the church together. But it's in the sanctification of time that um, the monks and nuns specifically um, offer back their work to the church. So what does this look like and why have I posted an image of a wagon wheel? Well, because look how we might say they sanctified time. At the heart of their activity is the divine liturgy is their dedication to the sacred services. So that's the hub of this wheel. Beyond that, they undertake the prayer of the hours. So as time ticks over, those hours are being turned over, offered up to God by means of prayer. So the divine liturgy, the actual and um, mystical presence of Christ is uh, made known every day uh, by means of his presence in the sacrament. And then uh, the hours that uh, both emanate from and return to Christ are set aside, are sanctified by being marked with prayer. So um, you'll be familiar, I suspect, with the monastic hours, but at the very least, if you don't know what they are, um, you'll have heard of matins and vespers, and that's the prayer of the morning and the prayer of the evening. Uh, but of course, there is also um, prime, purse, sext, known, and then after vespers, compline. So it's first hour, third hour, sixth hour, ninth hour and then the last hour before bed, and then we wake up and then and the rotation starts again. So divine liturgy at the heart, the hours become the turning spokes of time, the hours, literally. And finally, there is 
word. And it's work that becomes the rim of the wheel. So the wheel turns and work is fed by the hours and feeds back into the hours, which are themselves fed by the presence of Christ in the sacrament and um, return to the presence of Christ in the sacrament. So it's a cyclical life, not cyclical in a Buddhist sense, cyclical in a very, um, if linear and cyclical can go together, in a very linear sense. In other words, it has a telos, an end point, a purpose, and that purpose is the deification, not only of the individual monks and nuns themselves, but of the church. So in that respect, you could say that monastic life is doing for us, members of the church, what we are not necessarily able to do ourselves, but that we all work together in a symbiotic relationship, in a symbiotic movement. So I've just given you a theological picture, a spiritual picture of what monastic life is for and how it relates to the rest of the church, equally how we relate to it. I know that there are many practical elements to it that I haven't touched upon, not unlike last week's session by when we talked about the church and I said very little about the mechanics of the church or even what it looked like but rather talked about the theology of the church and its priestly role in the world. Well, here I'm doing it because I think this is fundamental for us to conceive of and carry with us as we progress in our lives, either toward or even within the Orthodox Church. And to close that uh, um, contemplation off, I offer you here a picture of a monk teaching what looks to be a family or it could be just a group of boys gathered around to listen to him but um, whatever the precise nature of the scene we have an orthodox monk teaching and this represents the fact that um, he's in this case carrying his work out into the world and in so doing uh, making contact with that world and drawing it back through his prayerful observance of the hours and his participation in the sacramental life of the church. That's monasticism. And of course, you'll know we can never do any of these topics justice in a small frame of time. But we're going to move on from monasticism now into the nature of prayer. I said that prayer was the first ingredient in um, monastic life. And as we discuss it here, we'll see how prayer actually, um, wh what it is on its own, but equally how it plays into the rest of our life and how the rest of our life can be taken up in prayer. So it also represents one of the questions I'm asked the most. Father, what is prayer? Am I praying correctly? Well, the answer is probably, and we'll see how and why. But first, we'll start with the most obvious form of prayer. That is liturgical prayer. When we think about the Orthodox Church, and we think about prayer in some kind of mathematical equation, we will likely come up with the mental image of liturgy. Because we literally and publicly gather together there with that exact purpose. Of course, the church building might be used for some other purpose, but chances are, if you've gone to the temple, if you've gone to the church, you've done so because there is a service going on and that service will be um, focused on prayer. So liturgical prayer is the most obvious form of prayer and i'm not going to say it's the worthiest but it is certainly um um a type of it represents a type of pinnacle of prayer insofar as it's common 
insofar as it's always liturgically or, or theologically correct, insofar as it's come down to us through the, the tradition of the church, so we can be assured of its good nature and assured of its efficacy. But it isn't the only way of praying. And as Orthodox Christians, we don't spend our literal entire lives in the setting uh, like the one you see before you. No, we go out into the world and we undertake personal prayer. Now, personal prayer can have all sorts of forms. And each one of us will probably pray instinctively. In the case of the image I've put on this slide, we see a man who looks like he's gone specifically to this uh, particular shrine. Um, and the painter has portrayed him as being surrounded by what looks like um, uh, the ghostly community, the community of love, probably including relatives. Um, I can see a, um, a priest in there. I can see children in there but people that represent his past. And I know nothing of the provenance of this painting, but I think it illustrates um, the kind of quiet that we can find within our personal prayer, um, especially as it's united to the church. Interestingly, this figure on our right, this man, is not looking up at the top of the cross as if pleading. Rather, he's looking down towards the base of the cross as if mourning or in some state of wistfulness. Either way, it's a warm image. In other words, he is not alone. And perhaps he feels that. Certainly the painters tried to convey um, the ghostly presence of that for which he longs around him. But you get the sense of quiet prayer. And let's attribute to this man a, a humility similar to the kind of humility I was talking about even before we started recording tonight when we were discussing uh, how we read the scriptures. It's a humility that um, allows God to speak back to him through uh, through the mind of the church. So it's a personal prayer that although undertaken outside of liturgical context is uh, one that unites. And here it appears to be silent. It doesn't have a form per se. Perhaps he's simply standing um, in, in silence and uttering nothing. Whether he was speaking or whether um, he is keeping his mouth shut, he is somehow communing with that which lies beyond him. And in that respect, personal prayer can be prayer of immense solace and immense benefit and gain. Then we might think of what I hear called traditional prayer. And this is also personal, although it can be communal, but is more formal in the sense that here I've used a prayer rope to um, portray what I mean insofar as a person might use the well-worn lines of the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Well, I make those words mine, but they're not my words in the sense that they are the words of a whole tradition that precedes me. And um, they invite me in. So they don't express my subjective feelings, but rather they speak a truth which the collective wisdom of Christians, Orthodox Christians over time, have determined expressing need within me. 
And so I say it. Sometimes I say it um, without being as conscious as I might be. Sometimes I say it and I'm deeply affected by it. Sometimes I say it by rote. Sometimes I say it with great intentionality. My feelings, my subjectivity might change in relation to traditional prayer, but the traditional prayer keeps me anchored. In other words, it's the traditional prayer which speaks, and it's simply my willingness to enter into it that uh, makes it mine. So, personal prayer, probably unconnected with any sense of traditional wording, and much more subjective, although when undertaken in humility, in love, um, deeply effective. Traditional prayer, in other words, prayer using forms that are established, um, in some ways has a different purpose, although there's no such thing as separating purposes, really. In some ways, it has a different purpose, but it also deals with our subjectivity differently. So in this, perf in this picture, our main figure um, is dancing with God through his own subjectivity. In this instance, we're subordinating our subjectivity to something um, more long-standing and greater than ourselves. Then there's extemporaneous prayer. Now, I was taught as a boy that we might call these arrow prayers. These are the kinds of prayers we simply utter as we walk down the street, as we um, engage in our daily lives. Sometimes we don't know we're praying, although we should be very cautious and conscious regarding the fact that when we say, oh my God, we are in fact calling on the divine. Now, that might not seem like much of a prayer, but actually, especially when uttered by a Christian in the face of some um, unfolding tragedy, for example, it is a prayer. But of course, there are less dramatic versions. So, um, you walk down the road and you see somebody in need and you can't do much about it because you've got your baby in a pram and you've got to get somewhere very quickly, but you've clocked it. You simply offer it up. Lord, have mercy on that person. Or, uh, Lord, let this meeting this afternoon go well for me. It may be all you utter, but it counts. It's not a replacement for the kinds of prayer we've talked about, and it's not good enough if that's our only um, interaction with God who invites us to something so much more and so much richer, but it counts, especially inside the context of a larger framework of prayer. So extemporaneous, don't discount it. Be aware that you yourselves are likely engaging in it multiple times a day. And that might be with a form of words that might be um, spontaneous, but literally by, by means of uh, a gasp. Or it might be because you cross yourselves um, as you, uh, you know, pass an ambulance while you're walking down the street. Whatever the case, it can be. Um, and I would say it should be encouraged to be part of the prayer life. But then, and this is where um, talking about prayer and that other aspect of the Christian life, our work, um, elide. This is where they dovetail. Praying through work. Now, we associate Benedictine monasticism with the Latin West because it was the dominant form of monasticism until the uh, high Middle Ages. But Benedictine monasticism, Latin monasticism, is very much Orthodox monasticism. After all, it had a good um, 
600 years or so to practice within the undivided church before it became the default or the major um, monastic tradition in the West exclusively. But I mention it because the Benedictine motto is ora et labora, pray and work. And if you think back to that um, wagon wheel diagram I gave you a few moments ago, what is the rim of the wheel? How does the wheel actually um, progress? It turns on its hub. And what turns are the spokes, but it can't and won't go anywhere if there isn't the, um, the outer element, the outer life. And that's, from a Benedictine point of, work, uh, point of view, work. And here I've depicted work as manual labor. There is great virtue in manual labor, and I think manual labor is especially conducive to a Christian life. Now, I say that with some uh, sense of, well, no, with some awareness of the irony, because if any of you know me, you'll know that I have very little um, engagement with manual labor. I've done it in my life, but 90% um, of what I do is not at all manual. But I also look at some uh, workers with a sense of envy. Don't worry, not in a seriously deep way or anything. But I do look at those who are able to work with their hands and look and, and see at the end of the day the progress they've made and, and think there must be a real satisfaction in that. Meanwhile, I am aware from my limited experience that there are some forms of manual work that actually allow you to literally pray while you do it. So, by way of example, I used to work in my early student days in a furniture warehouse in Winnipeg. And it was my task to sort out, those of you who grew up in the 70s and 80s will remember waterbeds, at least North Americans will. Um, but uh, I had to sort out all of the plethora of waterbed parts that we stocked in the warehouse. And it took me multiple days, multiple shifts. And um, it was wonderful. It was the most monotonous um, and potentially boring work you could have imagined. It was bright and sunny outside. It was um, a series of summer days over which I did this. But I got to do nothing. But... Um, pray while I was using my hands. And I did. I did other things as well, of course, uh, including fooling around with my workmates and uh, you know, calling each other names. But um, prayer was part of that activity. And um, that prayer combined with the um, concrete uh, results of work can be very, very beneficial. That's all an aside. Through our work, we can offer ourselves to God. We can offer our work, no matter what it is, as a prayer. And so when I, and I have had this, have had um, mothers come to me and say, oh, I haven't been able to keep the Lenten fast because, um, you know, I'm, I'm currently um, feeding my baby and I have, you know, I'm very, very tired. And the, the only answer to that is stop and don't worry. Just the fact that you're doing these things is in itself a prayer. All of the sacrifices you make, whether through external work or whether through um, working within your own home for this benefit of your family, whoever you are, that especially when intentionally offered up, is a prayer. So these are the different types of prayer. And I end with one final form. I'm distinguishing sacramental from liturgical. 
because there can be no question that going to make our confession is a prayer. And yet it's not formally liturgical in the sense that attending divine liturgy with a long order is liturgical. I don't want to make a sharp distinction, but I did want to suggest that there are the little, um, what, what I might call the less public sacramental um, um, ways of engaging with God that uh, we can understand as, as representing another form of prayer. For surely the man or woman or child who goes before a priest to make their confession will have done so after at least some consideration and personal prayer. So all the things we've just talked about are fundamentally one. They're all united. And yet it's helpful to separate the threads, you might say, in order to understand the different elements that make up a fuller life of prayer. And um, so when somebody says to me, Father, do I pray well? How do I pray well? What does prayer mean? Well, it, it means living, first and foremost, living the life of the church as best you can in your life. Um, and in so doing, you will find yourself turning to God on a personal level. You will already find yourself in the church whenever you can get there. You will um, carry that with you when you're going about your daily labors and you will avail yourself of the sacraments. Um, so um, I wouldn't be comfortable if I left you with the impression that somehow, um, you know, it's, it's possible to distinguish these threads absolutely, um, but ultimately they lie at the, the the base of the Christian life. I've just talked about sacramental form of prayer, so we turn finally to the sacraments themselves and we unpack them a little bit. Let's start. Very simply, in orthodoxy, there are seven sacraments. I could put a full stop there, but I have to say that this number is really only used for ecumenical convenience. Why? Because certainly if you talk to a Catholic or many Anglicans, they will talk about seven sacraments. And there's nothing wrong with this, but always remember that within orthodoxy, there is some elasticity to a lot of what might otherwise just be another category. Seven sacraments uh, applies, uh, and I'll list them now, but we'll go through them specifically in a moment, to baptism, chrismation, holy communion, confession, um, anointing, uh, matrimony, and ordination. But there's so much else that the church does that looks awfully sacramental, not only to me, but to um, the church. So what are they? I've listed them already. Let's go through them in a bit more detail. We start with baptism. We start because it is the beginning. Baptism is the moment we can consider ourselves to have passed through the waters that allow us to start on the Christian journey through life. Baptism is the moment when we uh, put away our old selves and are clothed in the uh, garment of Christ. There are so many metaphors we could use to apply to baptism, but it is a glorious and um, most, I suppose in the true sense of the word, incredible sacrament. It is um, the starting point for all that we do as the church. Of course, it involves um, triple immersion in water whenever possible. I want to make clear that we don't tend to talk in terms of validity and invalidity in the Orthodox Church. Um, the Orthodox Church 
sees baptism as being truly um, valid when it is done with the intent of making a Christian by means of water and the three, the, the formula of the Trinity. So baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So here you see a full immersion baptism. There are places and occasions when a full immersion is not possible. That is um, permissible by the church. And um, I'm trying to avoid polemic right now. Uh, I would say that uh, just simply don't let anybody ever worry you about the validity of your baptism. If you have talked to the priest and the priest, as a representative of his bishop, has said that, um, no, your, your, your baptism is valid or the way in which he's done it um, is valid, then it's valid. Um, so if if I've just said something that is irrelevant to you because you don't know what I'm talking about, forgive me and just bear with me. Um, but anybody who's been online in the last couple of years and explored orthodoxy may have encountered various arguments that are going on. Um, it's undermined a lot of people's confidence in um, different, uh, ba uh, different baptisms that they have experienced, um, different people have experienced. And I guess all I'm trying to say is that the church recognizes one type of baptism, a three, uh, you know, a, a baptism with water and the name of the Holy Trinity. And um, if the church has said that yours is valid, it's valid and we can trust that. But baptism is actually not really complete until um, chrismation has taken place. Now, how do I mean that? Well, this is where the number of sacraments can be actually unhelpful. We say seven and we separate out chrismation um, because in the Latin West, they separated it out and called it confirmation and they do it at a separate time, but we don't do it as a separate time. Chrismation is part of baptism. In other words, um, if it's an infant, we baptize the infant and almost immediately afterward, we chrismate the infant. And the chrismation represents the, or is, not represents, is the seal of the Holy Spirit on that person. Now let's back up a few weeks and consider the picture I gave you of the work of Christ. I created that teardrop shaped image whereby the incarnation, God's word, makes his way into the world and takes on flesh, walks with us, offers himself up on the cross, rises again, and returns to his right hand at the Father. And so ended that session. But then the next session, we looked at the person of the Holy Spirit. And what did I do? I took that same image and I filled it in with orange that was meant to represent flame. In other words, it was the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Well, you might say that baptism is, a, is like taking on Christ and chrismation is being thereafter empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so they are fundamentally, intrinsically related. Once the sacraments have taken place, then even infants are admitted to Holy Communion. Holy Communion is what most of us experience because we, if we were baptized at infants, we have no recollection of our baptism. If we were baptized later or chrismated later, then it happened once. But what happens every week uh, or more is our celebration of the Divine Liturgy and the service of Holy Communion. I don't need to say much about Holy Communion except that um, we must understand that as we approach this holy mystery, we are truly receiving, we are truly partaking in the body and blood of Christ. We have no scientific explanation for it. 
we're not going to uh, pull a Latin debate here and talk about transubstantiation or consubstantiation or it is simply and mystically the body and blood of Christ. And um, I could say a great deal more about it. And we could look at the sort of the history of how the church in the West has debated it, but that's not relevant uh, to us. It is a sublime mystery. And uh, as we uh, partake of it, we are nourished for the journey, the journey through uh, the course of our lives. Related to communion is confession. And this is the way I talk about it in my parish. Some people are very concerned that confession take place before every reception of the holy mysteries uh, of the chalice. Um, I don't know that the timeline always matters. In other words, I don't know that it matters exactly when you make confession. What matters is that you understand, is that we understand, that confession and communion are intimately related. And if you never made confession, that might signify um, something to worry about. Because confession is a relieving, it is a cleansing sacrament. It is one that makes it possible to truly uh, receive the body and blood of Christ, to receive it well to receive it well. Confession is, if you think in, in a hospital metaphor, and I was going to apply the hospital metaphor to all of the sacraments, but let's just introduce it here. Confession is like the surgical operation you undertake when you go into the hospital as a patient. And Holy Communion is like the food you are seed, or you are um, served while you are um, undergoing the healing process. So both are medicines for the soul. You can't have the operation unless you're well nourished. You equal, equally, there is not much point in being uh, continually nourished if you have no intention of ever entering the operating theater, or you might as well vacate the hospital bed. They are symbiotically related. And um, there's a great deal to say about each and every sacrament individually, but I just want to impress on you the beauty of confession because it is the invitation by Christ himself to be unburdened, to be um, purified, to be better prepared for the reception of him into your very body. Another healing sacrament is anointing, which is a sacrament very specifically um, set aside for that purpose. Anointing, especially in the West, is associated with last rites, something that's done um, just before death. Uh, although, to the credit of, of Western Christians, they've also sought to move away from that language over the last number of decades. But in Orthodoxy, it is a sacrament that is offered in any time of trouble or illness. Um, and in fact, is offered um, in Holy Week, for example, whereby we have a rite that involves multiple priests and people coming forward. It's on a Wednesday in in Holy Week and where people are anointed. But anointing has to do with the healing grace and, um, and is something uh, the church offers to all who suffer at any point in life. And of course, um, that suffering doesn't have to be uh, explicit or some particular form, which is one of the reasons why in Great and Holy Week, um, the whole church is invited forward to be anointed. Matrimony. This is... Um, an interesting sacrament insofar as it's a relatively late development for the church uh, to undertake it at all. But uh, I don't know about other um, dioceses and jurisdictions in Britain. 
I do know that it is our custom in the archdiocese that um, a couple should be wed according to the state before they approach us for crowning or holy matrimony. Um, the service itself is beautiful and uh, is one of great joy. But what it does is to bind a couple into a greater iconological relationship with God, the Holy Trinity. Now, how's that for a mouthful? It binds a couple more intimately into an iconological relationship with God, the Holy Trinity. What do I mean by that? God is three persons, and the economy by which God operates is love. And that love is bound together in such a way as to give rise to creation. And so when we see a couple, and especially when we see a couple that has been blessed with children, we see an icon of um, Trinitarian love and um, and um, the creative results of that, the fruitful results of that love. So matrimony is essentially um, the sanctifying of a human reality mm -hmm. that um, by the sanctification of it um, becomes by its nature an icon. So moving on from matrimony, because I'm aware of time, we finish with ordination. Ordination is the setting aside of men within the Christian community for particular service. Some will accuse me of using Protestant language right now, but I think it's helpful. By virtue of our baptism, we are all members of the body of Christ. We are all priests. Why? Because Christ is the great high priest and we're parts of his body. There's little theological argument against that. However, as is so much of what the church does, it's a, a by way of particularizing Christ's priestly work, we call out of the whole church particular men to undertake it. So Christ offers himself in the bread and wine. Um, and so we call um certain people apart to make that possible to to uh lead us in 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 making christ known as he promises to be known there are bishops priests and deacons um that comprise the major orders of the church there are also minor orders so acolyte um reader subdeacon there have been different um numbers of orders and different named orders at different time in times in history but bishop priest and deacon are the major orders that have never changed and really as i think i indicated when we were talking about the church last week the bishop is the priest the high priest you might say of the diocese he's the priest par excellence and uh, priests and deacons then exist as his vicars in the true sense of the word they are there to act vicariously on behalf of the bishop to effect christ's priestly work at the local level so that's a bit of a mouthful but it's where i'm going to draw to a close because i've talked far too long tonight and um want to close with just one challenge i said seven was a, um, a number of convenience. And then I described how baptism and chrismation really are difficult to consider separate one from the other. Um, well, let's throw an extra sacrament in, I say um, cautiously, but what about a coronation? Looks terribly sacramental to me. The blessing of the Jordan water on, on uh, theophany looks quite sacramental um th that's why we don't have to think in terms of strict numbers 
if somebody says, how many sacraments does your church have? You can certainly say seven. But you might also just remember in your head that, um, uh, yes, but there's a great deal that the church undertakes uh, in a sacramental way. So, conclusion, the Orthodox Christian life is simply monastic. It consists of work, prayer, contemplation, repentance, fasting, and participation in the sacraments. Goodness, I've talked a lot. So I'm going to open up to um, to Josh. Yes, if you want to unmute yourself, please, and uh, ask what you will. Hi, sorry, I have two questions. So maybe I can kind of do one or stick them into one. Fire so um, when it comes to, um, for, I, I, I understand that kind of um, in orthodoxy, the tradition is to have like a, say like a 7 p.m. prayer or, or an evening prayer as such. Does that prayer need to follow something like in a prayer book, like the like the an English, an Orthodox prayer book, you know, Book of Common Prayer, or can it be like just a I am spending time with God, doing the Lord's prayer, and just bringing my day before God? If that makes sense. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I would offer you an answer by degrees, and what I mean is, there's an ideal. This is so often applicable to uh, all different aspects of the Orthodox life. There's an ideal, which is the hours, Vespers, actually praying Vespers or Compline. But how many of us actually can manage to do that? First of all, just knowing how to is uh, is a bit of a science at times. But um, but there's time issues, especially if you're a parent. There's you know there are many practical challenges. So ideally, we would pray the formal and full prayers of the church, but um failing that the church also offers um various prayer books plural which offer short forms of prayers for evening and for morning um and i even have a small pocket prayer book that was given to me many years ago that includes even shorter forms and um that's handy when you're traveling or when you're you know driving along and uh, you realize the sun is setting and um you know you haven't really had time to to offer or spend uh, to spend time in prayer that day um but failing that the lord's prayer that's the ultimate um formal or traditional prayer it's given to us by christ himself um and i would use that as the nucleus around which we offer any other prayers uh, but all prayer is valid so if you think of an ideal and you pare it down or you take account of your various uh, life conditions and you find that well it's not possible to um, pray all of vespers or it's not possible or i forgot my prayer book or i did this or i did that um and all you can manage is the Lord's Prayer and some time spent with him um, in, in contemplation. That is absolutely of, uh, of value and absolutely counts as prayer. So would I make a habit of it? I would always try to make a rule, a rule whereby I conform my prayer life to the wider sort of traditional uh, prayer life of the church but also making allowances for conditions and finally giving permission to myself to pray in that sort of perhaps um, uh, more personal way uh, that I personally, I'll, I'll speak literally personally right now, I've always found very helpful because that's just been a part of, of who of my own walk with God over the course of my life. So there's room for it all, but I would definitely seek to structure, give my prayer a framework of, that, that, that is based in the tradition of the church. Fantastic. Thank you. And my second, it's got plenty of really quick questions. So I've been in the Catholic churches before, and at least in the ones I've been to, it's like confession is open for half an hour every Saturday. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing a congregation of 100 people, and I'm saying, how's that going to work? 
So how does that work in the Orthodox Church? I mean, are you required to make a confession every week before you take Eucharist? Sorry, I almost said communion. I'm showing my background. Um, do you, can you make it like once a month? Is personal confession okay? Like, sorry, I know those are a lot of questions. It's no problem. Um, it's a very important one and one that's probably on the minds of many of us who are here tonight. Some of the answer I'm going to give you will be based on jurisdiction and tradition. Some of it will be based on pastoral ob observation. Um, there are some jurisdictions that will be absolute about their requirement for confession to be made before any reception of Holy Communion. I am not of that school myself. Does that mean I diminish confession? No. Um, what I do is say that confession and communion are intimately related and that we should always approach Holy Communion with a penitent um, disposition, you know, with a recognition of who we are as we approach Christ, as he offers himself to us. But think back to that hospital metaphor I gave you, however much I, uh, I glossed over it. You go to the hospital, you therefore an operation, but you can't, you know, you, your healing depends both on being fed and on the operation. The, our, our healing as Christians, our deification, our growth in Christ depends both on the healing operation, i.e. on confession, on our reconciliation, and on our nourishment. So really, they both go together. Now, having said that, partly, I, I like, although I'm crystal clear about, about saying that, I also think there is an element of people's consciences convicting them of the need for confession. So I, hear, I end up hearing confessions every week. Um, before and or after liturgy. But um, I, I like to think that the reason I end up being kept so busy hearing confessions is that people have been convicted in themselves that they need that because it is fundamentally therapeutic. And that's so beautiful. They come because they want it and they've learnt to want it, if that makes sense. I'm very loath to say, you must do it this week. Not because I want to diminish it, but because I think you can move into a pattern of making confession by rote as well. So there are dangers on both sides, overemphasizing it and causing people to do it out of obligation and underemphasizing it and causing your own people to lose out on its immense therapeutic and and um, comforting benefits. So if I struggle to answer your question, it's only because I'm kind of in the middle. I don't want to diminish the importance of confession one iota, but I also don't want to um, uh, see it uh, succumb to um, the sense of obligation that actually ends up diminishing it in a different way. But are there absolute rules? Is there a book that says all communions must be preceded by confession? No, there aren't. Some jurisdictions practice that, and that's entirely up to that jurisdiction. Um, but in spiritual terms, there are no absolutes in that regard. What's important is that, like the hospital metaphor, we understand that they work together for our benefit and our healing. Thank you so much. Thank you, I, I, I'm saying this as a as a slightly um, fun jab at our Anglican friends. It sounds very Anglican, with the uh, you know the via media. Well, yeah, I mean. 
there is some truth to that now i i would uh, obviously uh pick apart the via media language but it's let's call it instead um a pastoral application of an absolute theological truth um and i hope that doesn't sound wishy-washy because i don't mean it that way at all i just mean that to put into concrete some form of practice as if it's law is to make it fragile because concrete breaks no that's really cool i mean i like it this that's not a that's not a criticism by the way yeah. i like it so uh anyway my apologies i've taken up too much time I'll, somebody else. thank you for your questions younger Hello, Father. I, I, yeah. am here. I am, yes. So my question is that, so in a typical pray, prayer book, it mm -hmm. usually consists of a morning and evening prayer. Yeah. Is there a specific time that we should uh, pray them? <laughs> Not really, but the first thing, I mean, we're always encouraged when we wake up in the morning to offer ourselves to God. And there's no better way to do that than by prayer. So whether you do that quite literally by waking up, seeing the sun peering through your window, I say that as a joke, we are British after all, um, but seeing the sun peer through your window and saying, thank you, God, for bringing me to the beginning of this day. Um, well, that would count because you're offering yourself up, you're offering thanks and you're getting on. But half an hour later after you've gotten out of bed and brushed your teeth and and had your coffee you then go into um, praying a formal morning prayer i think that would be wonderful some people might be able to get out of bed immediately and stand at their icon corner and offer morning prayer before they do any of the other stuff if they can wonderful but there isn't a set time it's more about um you know, God being first and last in our minds. In other words, um, us turning to him with thanksgiving uh, in the morning upon uh, awakening and, uh, you know, before going to bed. The traditional hours do correspond with specific times. So, um, you know, is first hour six? Yeah, uh, first hour is six, third hour is nine, um six hours 12 etc so yes there are traditional times but even those are relative because um you know in the early middle ages they weren't working with watches they were working according to the cycles of the sun and and seasons and consequently the third hour of the morning would have been different in the year 750 than it is in 2024 so don't be too strict about the specific times be aware that yes there is a tradition whereby the different types of prayer are related to different hours but what matters is that as orthodox christians we remember god in the morning we remember god in the evening does that answer your question yes thanks, thanks for asking it all right archangel gabriel uh, Ross has a question Hi, for you, Father. Okay. Okay, Ross. Thank you. Thank you again for the for the talk. Um, it's just a couple of easy ones for me. Um, you mentioned a book at the start. Um, but I missed the the author and the title, so I was just wondering if you could go go back over that again for me. Yeah, that was uh, Paul F. Dokomov. And the book is yeah. simply called Orthodoxy. Sorry, the title. What was the title again? Simply Orthodoxy. I'll, I'll see if I can find it, um, if I can multitask as we talk, um, and um, I'll put it into the link, uh, into the chat. Perfect. Um, the only other thing was uh, the question at the very, very start, you were talking about like self-reading the Bible and, and how to interpret that and things. I just wondered if there was any resources that you had off the top of your head to to make sure or to to adjust our own interpretation so it is more in line with the church um that's a tough one for me and i only say that because 
I'm only speaking personally here. It's never dawned on me to read the Bible in an interpretive way for myself. Um, so what I would say is that I've become familiar of late with um, the work that Father Stephen DeYoung from Ancient Faith, which I seem to be mentioning increasingly as part of our catechism, but it's it's a trustworthy and good place to turn. But Father Stephen DeYoung is a biblical scholar, but also I've noticed that Father Lawrence Farley has published quite a number of books with Ancient Faith, which are biblical commentaries. Um, I would I would fundamentally trust both of those authors and uh and start there my own i mean i have to admit even when i was in seminary even when i was uh, studying uh, theology for for preparation uh, for the priesthood in the early 90s although i turned to biblical commentaries at time i found that in terms of understanding the text um i think there was a book by an author called Kronk, which was called The Message of the Bible. It was um, published by St. Vladimir's Seminary Press. I used that, and I used the Orthodox Study Bible and the notes in that, together with its essays. So it was I was more shaped by those sources than I was by any particular commentary or anything. Now, I'm the first one to admit I am not a biblical scholar. You know, my my field is different. And um, consequently, I suppose I've always kind of just trusted the church on, 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 on biblical interpretive questions. But I hope that helps a little bit. Definitely, you'll find, I would say if it's published by Ancient Faith, it's going to be pretty trustworthy. But especially Stephen DeYoung, a priest I've come to love by listening to, and his uh, book, um, The Whole Council of God, uh, also, of course, the commentaries by Father Lawrence Farley as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, by the by, the way, that that doesn't mention the patristic commentaries because there's plenty of those, and I can't believe I've even neglected them for a moment. But there's so many there. I would actually want to develop a bibliography and share that out. I'm just talking about in terms of modern aids. Okay. Thank you for asking. Thank you, Father. Now, uh, Michael, if you want to come in, and then Ian. Um, thanks, Father. Um, apologies for being late. Um, I uh, I was wondering if you've got any resources uh, in terms of, um, I'm thinking about marriage uh, and, the, and the rules surrounding marriage, because um, I, I come from a Catholic background, and the, the, the rules are quite often ignored, but there's there is a still a standard that you can point to and say well uh, you know contraception is not allowed and, and divorce isn't allowed it, it seems as if within orthodoxy there's a bit more of uh there's a bit more of a kind of give and take a wee bit it, it doesn't seem as if the rules are quite as hard and fast on that i was just wondering if uh if there's any kind of resources that you could point to or if you you know, I know it's a big one, but I'm not expecting that, you to answer the that, whole thing. Well, in the that's a brilliant minutes. question. Uh, I love it. And uh, I think, you know, the first thing I would say is that um, let no one think for a moment that somehow the church accepts something like divorce, because that's just absurd. But in a way, I'll answer you in a similar way to uh, how I answered Joshua's question earlier. Um, you know, we we believe something truly. You know, in terms of the, uh, the 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 holy nature of marriage. But there's also a pastoral reality, or sorry, a pastoral um, approach applied to people's experienced reality, and so it, we don't stop saying what's true. But we equally understand that it's not easy for everybody in their various life conditions to live up to what's true. And so we work with individuals and couples and what you know pastorally to try to do help them do their best and to help the church do its best to um 
to allow greatest possible conformity. Does that make sense? Uh, it definitely does, Father. Thanks. Thanks for um, a, a resource I would point you to in that regard, and and I promise all of you, I'm not. Uh, I, I have no shares in uh, Paul of Dokumov's estate, yeah. but um, he wrote a book. I think the title was "The Sacrament of Love." by the same author so uh look that up uh, i'm becoming increasingly convinced as we talk over these sessions that i really need to create a bibliography covering each of our topics um but uh if i don't remember to do that and you have any trouble finding it please get in touch and i'll i'll share it with you Thanks for that, Father. I think I found that. Oh, wonderful. Good, good. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Yes, thanks. Ian. Hello, Father. Um, th thanks for the presentation so far. Uh, just a quick question. Um, when we pray, so, you know, we, there are times like we pray for peace in the church or we pray for, you know, God to take away pain and things like that. You know, I was reading a book that said that, well, you know, although God doesn't will <clears throat> there to be, you know, evil in the world, he allows it. So if God allows evil and he allows us to experience pain for our salvation, then what are we really praying for, if that makes sense? Okay. Like, what, what do we want God to change? I mean, are we not kind of like, you know, not challenging as well but you know if god allows it then why what does prayer do if that I makes love, sense love the question it is a perennial question christian question um but i you know the fact that you've asked it is is brilliant i don't know is the answer but i don't i don't mean that flippantly i mean prayer is what it does is it manifests the graceful, loving relationship that exists between God and his children, i.e. us. So, um, fundamentally, we're not seeking to change God's mind when we pray because that would be almost absurd but we are if we pray with love and humility we actually are allowing ourselves to be changed as we grow in our realization of who god is as we relate to him and he relates to us so there's kind it's you might say it's a reflective effect and I think C.S. Lewis said something like that. Um, but whether he did or did not, it makes a lot of sense, it seems to me, that prayer is as much about us being changed by our prayer as it is about wanting God to change his mind. Yet, there is also evidence that prayer is incredibly effective at bringing about um a desired end and what i mean is saint john of Kronstadt, in his uh book on the on the priesthood talks about taking heaven by storm with our prayers and being so insistent in our prayers that um you know we not let up until um god does what we want now he doesn't phrase it like that literally but it's a very striking passage. And I've often thought, well, how does that fit in with the idea that prayer actually changes us? I think it's this. I was in my 20s and I was in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and I went to a church on Ascension, the Feast of the Ascension. And the priest there um, said, ask god for everything 
and of course he's he's quite a dramatic preacher anyway but uh, you know the, the congregation i'm sure for a moment is sitting there wondering what he said really if you want a new set of golf clubs ask god for it if you want your mortgage payments made for you ask god for it if you want health for your loved one ask god for it why because god in the word has taken up our, every prayer we could offer in his ascension in his body he has taken us with him and so even as we converse right now in our case via zoom we are in the presence of god and there is nothing about our very being that he doesn't already know and know that we need or want and at exactly the same time he's also given us everything we need and want how and why when i pray for health for a loved one what am i praying for i'm praying for joy i'm praying for the comfort of knowing that my loved one will be okay and guess what that prayer has already been answered. He will be. Right? When I'm praying for my mortgage payments to be paid off miraculously, what am I praying for? I'm praying for the comfort of knowing that I will have a roof over my head and for the over the heads of my family. Well, um, the bank hasn't foreclosed on us yet. Um, the 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 fact is wonderfully and perhaps even miraculously we've been able to maintain our you know our uh you know staying on top of our bills but um the the other thing is that even if the worst happened because i've offered all of those prayers in faith say the bank did foreclose on our house and took it away well i think things would probably still be okay I don't know how, but you know whether it was under a bridge or whether it was by moving up north to live at my mother's house. My mom's on here right now, so I'll say God forbid. Uh, but uh, the you know the fact is it would still be okay, right? And so in that, I think it's what it what what Lewis means by saying that prayer changes us as well. In other words if we are offering up our requests and our desires in humility and in love in the knowledge and the confidence that actually god already knows these things he already contains them within himself because christ has carried them to his very bosom then we are changed by that knowledge because we then live with greater comfort and confidence knowing that things are going to be taken care of and and, and okay there are probably many tributary questions, many sort of little questions that we could raise in response to that. And I've got some in my own head um, that I could add to that. But as a, as a short answer, that's the way I would um, approach what you've asked. And I just thank you for it, because I think that's an incredibly important and really helpful question. Um, so I'll pause and give the last one over to me, 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 it says in the chat. So uh, go ahead above okay there's a question above which i have missed with regard to personal prayer very often when this person prays god literally speaks back the same for this person's father is that crazy no it's not crazy i would say this experiences that we have of god have a fundamentally personal side to them what i mean is um as a little boy and i'm sure this is the experience of many of us on here i'd get sore shins you all remember lying in bed as an eight-year-old and sort of crying because your shins hurt um you know it's just growing pains but i remember distinctly um praying god take this pain away and I would fall asleep despite the pain and I'd wake up in the morning and think I've just experienced a miracle bear in mind I'm eight years old right but it was probably true now what I mean is 
there i i experienced precisely the effect i wanted to i.e i got enough comfort that i was able to fall asleep after praying to god well what is that science can tell us exactly what it is in a mechanical way but it doesn't really matter in the sense that my perception was of being held in the hand of god and that's personal in other words yes i've just said it in public to all of you um and of course anybody who sees this on youtube later will hear the story again but it's personal in the sense that it was just one of those tiny little things that added to who i became as a person of faith over time and the same goes for lots of what you might call minor miracles um if you or a family member or both you and a family member experience god as speaking to you i would only say two things a it's not crazy but submit it to the church just like we were talking at the very beginning about ways of reading scripture we do we we extract what we do we try to process what we do with the church in other words it's a bigger mind a bigger it's got a bigger perception than we do and when we um submit our experience submit our um our uh questions to the the greater mind of the church then we will be safer in interpreting that experience than if we just go off suddenly declaring ourselves to be mystics or or you know uh, uh, taking on for ourselves um you know bigger uh bigger experiences than they really were so not at all to diminish the experience of anyone who um experiences god talking to them only to say that when we gain such experiences we perhaps keep them to ourselves and we allow them to nourish us as we grow in faith and where we can't keep them to ourselves or where they seem to be more important than just keeping them to ourselves then we share them with the church wisely in other words we have a conversation with a priest a monk a, a spiritual figure that we trust and we know to be trustworthy and we allow it to be then processed by the whole mind whatever we do we can never insist that i had this experience i'm right i know and uh, now the church has to listen to me so i hope that answers your question in a positive way um the next question is that uh this person um is thinking about uh adhd uh, in light of the difficulty with focusing on prayer for more than a minute um what would what should you do pray don't worry about focus our lord um is with you and if you are seeking to pray um then you're in exactly the right place there are certain techniques that can help and by all means ask other people about this for example um whatever priest or monk or trusted christian elder is near you um but uh, don't let it worry you or get you down one thing that helps within orthodoxy we have the jesus prayer the simplest prayer in the world in many ways but as the writer of the way of the pilgrim says contains the entirety of the gospel in a sentence right and of course takes no time at all having a prayer rope helps because it's tactile it's something you can hold it makes prayer quite tangible so never give up never despair that your prayer isn't enough when you're offering yourself to god however you do that if you're doing it in love and humility then it's prayer and it counts so with that i'm going to excuse myself
but I'm going to do so thanking all of you for being here and uh, saying that I, I find these sessions uh, joyful. So um, I don't know what you think I'm giving to you, but you're giving back to me. So thank you and God bless you. We will see you next week.